All right. Well, I have a surprise for you this morning. I have asked my two daughters to share in the first session. And um, I told them, I said, you know, you girls have been raised in the word of faith. Jerry Ann was just, a, what, about a year old. She was born in 68. Terry was just a few months old uh, when I surrendered my life to the Lord and began this ministry. And she was born in 1969. So they've been in this all their lives. Terry told uh, Brother Copeland one time, Brother Copeland, I'm so glad you came and preached the word that changed my daddy's life because now I've been the daughter of a word of faith preacher all my life and I've never been the daughter of a paint and body man. <laughs> Amen. So this is all they've known. Uh, when, when I was studying the word when they were just little guys, uh, I'd set them on the sofa and I'd preach to them because I didn't have anybody else to preach to. And I'd, I'd get a revelation on, boy, I'd set them on the sofa and I'd just preach to them and they'd fall over. And I said, Carolyn, look, they fell out under the power of God. <laughs> I preached so long, they just went to sleep, you know. <laughs> but they were my first audience, praise God. And so I asked them to come and share this morning about things that they've learned about growing up in a home where the word of faith was the message, the lifestyle, praise God, and how it's affected their lives and their ministry. So Jerry Ann told me a little while ago, I'm the oldest, I will go first because Terry's going to steal my notes. <laughs> so welcome my daughter Jerry Ann, if you will. All right. Thank you, Dad. I'll have my turn. Good morning. Are you awake? I had to take my little one to school this morning in Granbury and then drive here an hour and a half to get here. Just got a little stressed out. Huh? Yes, I am. So, all right, I'm here. I'm good. So you're awake, right? Okay, I like some feedback, okay? So don't be all quiet on me, okay? So Daddy says to... Share with you guys what I've learned in 50 years. How do I do that in 30 minutes? How do I convey all that this man has taught me in 50 years? You know, not only is he my earthly father, but he's my spiritual father. He's taught me faith. He's taught me the power of my words and confession. He's taught me giving and tithing the principles of sowing and reaping. He's taught me to get up every day expecting the manifested presence and power and goodness of God. And, you know, it really wasn't difficult to put this message together because it's in me. It's who I am. It's ingrained in me. It's part of who I am. I'm a faith girl. I grew up in a household of faith. My mama is already crying. <laughs> My mama's crying. I see the tissue is out. It took less than five minutes, and she's crying. <laughs> the other day, Daddy and I went to Rockwell. He was preaching there, and the pastor asked me to get up and speak for a little bit, and someone in the audience like, you are your mama made over, your little preacher. <laughs> so I want to read this scripture to you, Proverbs 1, 8 through 9, the Passion Translation. It says, pay close attention, my child, to your father's wise words, and never forget your mother's instructions. For their insight will bring you success, adorning you with grace-filled thoughts, and giving you reins to guide your decisions. I am so grateful and so honored for my heritage of faith. You know, I've heard my daddy speak thousands of messages, and I never tire of hearing them. I've heard that on February 11th, 1969, at 3 o'clock in the morning, he surrendered his life to the Lord. We've all heard the story of Terry's fingers getting cut off in the nursery and how that marked Daddy's faith forever. We've all heard about Daddy preaching in the uh, abandoned laundromat in Andrews, Texas, and Oop showing up and being the first person to give into the ministry's airplane. And we've all heard, Willie, come on home. Say it with me. Willie, come on home. So we've all heard those messages. And they've inspired us and encouraged us and challenged us in our faith. 
So I thought today what I would do is do like a compilation of some of the messages that my dad has done through the years that are the ones that just came up inside of me, the ones I just thought of quickly. So the first one, in no particular order, is what I've learned from this man of faith is that the shadow of a dog never bit anyone. <laughs> Did you hear it before? <laughs> Shadows don't bite people. Psalms 23 says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Amen. Fear is a smokescreen. That's all it is, is a smokescreen. And what the enemy does is try to darken our thoughts and make it a shadow. A shadow. So that it comes between the word and what God is, the word that God's spoken and that, that fear and that shadow. It's a smokescreen. Don't fall for the smokescreen. Don't fall for the fear. Shadows are just fear and we don't fall for fear. Amen? When you have fear, then Satan has come between you and the word. A shadow is just Satan's smokescreen, and we don't fall for it. The second thing this man of faith has taught me is if Satan can't steal my joy, he can't keep my goods. James 1, 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials or temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. When you draw on that joy during the challenging times of life, it'll get you through every single time. Daddy says that faith is the dynamite and joy is the fuse. And when you stay in the presence of joy, when you stay in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy right. and faith will follow. Oh, no. Amen? Amen? He also taught me that based on Proverbs 6.31, that the thief has to restore and repay sevenfold, whatever he's stolen from us. That's our right. That's our inheritance as a child of God. God is not only in the business of multiplying, but he restores everything that Satan has stolen from us. Amen? Amen? Amen. I learned from my dad the biggest thing is quitting is not an option. Amen. Quitting is not an option. He's always said that his name is Jerry, having done all the Stan, Stan Savell. Well, guess what? That's my name too. <laughs> Jerry, having done all the Stan, Stan Savell. He's told us all our lives, Savelles aren't quitters. And Terry and I have often said, Daddy, are we adopted? Because we really want to quit right now. But I look too much like my mama. I know I'm not adopted. Savelles aren't quitters, and you're not a quitter. Amen? Amen? We're not quitters. We're not quitters. I've heard him say, quit and do what? He don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to who I used to be. Quit and do what? We're not quitters. We move forward in Jesus' name. I might get knocked down, but I never get knocked out. Micah 7, 8 says, when I fall, I shall arise. If you get knocked down seven times, what do you do? Get up eight. Amen? Are you? Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> This man of faith taught me to put on the whole armor of God so that I would be able to withstand the evil one, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper in Jesus' name. And we are not of them who draw back. You know what? Drawing back, quitting, giving up, waving the white flag of surrender is not part of my DNA. I'm a child of God. I'm not a quitter. I cannot be defeated. That's the way I grew up. Amen? My dad's always said, if it's a fight you want, then it's a fight you get. And when the dust settles, me and God will still be standing, and we win. Amen? You know, um, a few years ago, I was in Maui speaking at a church, and it was a Saturday before I was to speak. And I got this devastating news while I was there. I mean, the kind that gut punches you. I mean, hurting, painful. And I got to preach in the morning. I called my dad. 
Daddy, Daddy. He said, Jerry, you know what to do. He said, you draw on your most holy faith and you speak in tongues right now. You pray in the spirit. You know what to do. And you know what? I got up that next morning and I preached and no one in that church even knew what I was going through. And you know what? I wasn't faking it. I was faith in it. I was faith in it through because my daddy had taught me, you're not a quitter. You don't give up. You don't draw back. Even when you get devastating news, even when you get news that hurts, that's painful, you get up, you keep moving, and you go forward in Jesus' name. That's all I know. That's all I know. I'm not a quitter. I've been knocked down. You all know it. I've been knocked down, but I'm still standing. I'm still standing. So he said to me, draw on that faith. Build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. It works, people. It works. I'm living testimony of a God that restores someone's life when they've been to the bottom. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. He taught me that the biggest battle that you'll ever face in your life It's between your ears. It's your thought life. What you dwell on, what you meditate on, what you think on, what your most dominant thought is, that's the direction your life's going to go in. And what's so important is that we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. This has become a part of my daily life. 2 Corinthians 10.5 is part of my daily life that I take thought Take every thought and then make it captive. Because the old thoughts want to tell me you're this, you're that, you'll never this. And I, no, 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 I don't think like that. I don't think like that. I'm restored, I'm forgiven, I have a plan, I have a purpose. God still has a plan and purpose for my life. I also learned through him and through Kenneth Copeland that you don't combat thoughts with other thoughts. You combat thoughts with the words. So the minute a thought comes that doesn't line up with the word of God, I say, no, 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 I don't think like that. And I speak, I look like a crazy lady in my car driving because I'm talking to myself all the time. But it's important that what you dwell on, what you think on, what you meditate on is what God says. Amen? Your thoughts, you've heard this, your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your lifestyle, and your lifestyle becomes your destiny. So it's so important. It all starts right here in your thought life. Am I encouraging you today? I'm just trying to remind you. Just trying to remind you of a few things. So we take every thought captive, and we make it obedient to Christ. All of us have been in this a long time. Most of us, a long time, but you still have to do that battle and that thought life. Amen? Don't let the enemy take control of your mind. Speak against it with the word. Another powerful message I heard my dad speak is Psalms 84, 5 through 6. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart or on the highways to Zion. Here's the part. Passing through the Valley of Baca. Amen. Have you been to Baca before? Oh, yeah. The Valley of Misery. The Hebrew says the Valley of Tears. The Valley of Weeping. Been there. I used to live there. I don't live there anymore. As a child of God, we don't live in the Valley of Baca. We are passing through. Passing through the Valley of Baca. It's your inheritance, it's your destiny, not to live in Baca, but you're passing through. All of us, even today, all of us go through challenges and issues and struggles and and projects and things we're believing God for. And oftentimes, you know, you can get weary and kind of just want to sit down. Go, man, this is hard. I don't want to do this anymore. No, no, no. We don't camp out in Baca. We're passing through the Valley of Baca. Amen? Amen. Passing through. I heard a minister say one time that faith may cry and faith may crawl, 
but faith is always moving. So you might be in that valley, but you wipe those tears and you keep moving. Amen. You keep moving. I've had to do it, talking to myself, crying, but I'm not quitting. I'm moving forward. I don't live in Baca anymore. I'm passing through in Jesus' name. We are believers. We're not moved by what we see. We're not moved by what we feel. We're moved by the Word of God. And what we believe is the word of God. Amen? Amen. We pass through. We don't live in Baca. Number seven, the man of faith taught me that God is not a God that he should lie. That he's always faithful to his promises. He also taught me Hebrews 11.1. That faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. My parents have taught me that faith has a project, an eye of faith. They taught me about the eye of faith, and it's down in here. It's what you see. It's not manifested yet, but it's out there. And you get a picture, and you get an image of that thing down on the inside of you, and you don't back off till it's manifested. That's what faith is. It's simply trusting God in his promises that he's faithful to do what he says he'll do in your life. And when you get a picture of that and an image of that, that's what you're moving towards, and you don't back off from that. Am I talking to anybody today? Amen. This man of faith, he gave me a clear picture of what a loving, heavenly father looks like, that I can go boldly to the throne of grace and help when I need help in time of need. He's shown me what a loving father looks like. I get teared up on this part. That my daddy looks at me with eyes of love. You know what? He doesn't see my mistakes. He doesn't see my sin. He sees me through the blood of Jesus. That I can boldly go in my parents' presence. You know what? I don't stand out at their gate and say, if it's your will that I come in, Mom and Dad, please. You know what? I'm a Savell. I walk in because I can. Because I can. And not only that, I'm firstborn, and I'm named after him. So I boldly come in my parents' presence, not even thinking about what I've done and the mistakes I've made. They made that example to me, the way I can go to my heavenly father boldly to the throne of grace for help. You know what I even do at 50 years old? Sometimes I go sit on my daddy's lap. That's right. And when I'm struggling, and you know what he always says? Daddy will take care of it. He always says that to me. Daddy will take care of it. And that's, that's an example of my heavenly father. He says, Jerry... (laughs) <laughs> he says, Daddy's crying now. <laughs> I have a, such a revelation of the love of God for me that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And that's because of his example in my life. That no matter how wrong I've done, how many mistakes I've made, that he doesn't see me that way. He sees me doing what I'm called to do. He sees me standing in front of you today. That's the way my dad saw me long ago. So I have a clear revelation that I can go boldly before my heavenly father. And I plop down right in his lap and I say, Father God, I just need some love today. I just need some provision today. I just need some strength today. And you know what? He's El Shaddai. He's El Shaddai. He provides everything I need. And I got a clear picture of my heavenly father because of this man. Thank you, Jesus. This man of faith taught me how to bring my petitions before the father. Based on 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Mom and Dad started Terry and I out really young on the prayer petition. They have where Daddy typed out petitions. 
and we were believing God for winter coats. We didn't even have coats. And you can see mine and Terry's little scratch handwriting, Jerry and Terry, where they taught us the prayer of petition. I've learned that the prayer of petition is not a general prayer, but it's one that you've done research. It's like an attorney who's done research and who has to go to the scripture and find out the will of God because in his word is his will. That's where you find out the will of God is in his word. So you find out specific scriptures for what you're believing God for. Like an attorney, you research and you prepare. And once you found those scriptures, and Daddy likes to type them out, and he said he would even get a suit on like he was an attorney and go before the Father God. And you present that word back to Father God. And you say, it is written. Your word says this, that my God shall supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. Or if you're believing God for a healing, you write those healing scriptures down and you present it back to God. Because he's not a God that he should lie. His word is truth. And so when you present that back, then you know according to his will, he hears you. And going back to faith, once you presented it, then you stay in faith. Trusting that he heard you. And then he'll answer your prayer. Wow, what a profound, like, revelation to know that we have that kind of access to go to the Father and present his word back to him. Thank you, Daddy, for teaching us that. The tenth thing Daddy taught me is God makes provision for his children. One of my favorite stories, Daddy, or ministers, sermons daddy preached was from Mark 14 of Jesus telling the disciples to go into town to prepare for a Passover meal and they would find a man with a pitcher in his hand. Have you heard that story before? Verse 16 says, then the disciples set out and came to the city and found everything just as Jesus had told them. God makes a way and brings provision. But you know what the key is? You have to be in fellowship with God to hear his instructions, to be in the right place at the right time for those divine connections. That he will meet your need, but you have to be in tune. You have to be in fellowship. You have to be listening. You know, most Christians spend their time looking for that man with the picture in his hand. But Daddy says there's a deeper, greater way as a child of God to be living to become that man with the pitcher in his hand. And my parents have become that. They went from having absolutely nothing, nothing, to now they are the man with the pitcher in his hand. That's who I want to be, the man with the pitcher in his hand, that I'm not always looking for someone to bless me, but like they say, that you're living to give. That's the ultimate way to live, is living to give. So that you can bless other people. So let's be that. Let's be the man with the pitcher in his hand. You're doing that just by being here today. Blessing this ministry. And putting your finances in what we're doing here at the ministry. You are the man with the pitcher in his hand. Lastly, this man of faith taught me. Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful man shall abound in blessings. When we are faithful to God, he is faithful to us. We're just so no matter what. Sowing has to become a lifestyle. It's a part of who I am. I don't know anything different. I'm a giver and I'm a tither because my parents taught me that. The awesome thing about the God we serve is that he never forgets a seed sown. He never forgets his seed sown. And as a tither and a giver and as a right, you're right as a child of God, then you can have abundant life and you can abound in blessings. But the key is faithfulness. The key is faithfulness. Faithful is to be loyal, constant, and steadfast. I think that we can say that about my dad. That 50 years, he's a faithful man because he's been loyal, constant, and steadfast. 
I believe you can say like me, that's my desire. I want when people to see me, they go, wow, she's a faithful girl. She's steadfast. She's been constant. I think we can learn from his example of 50 years. But the key is this. Daddy said that the scripture that changed his life was John 8, 31. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He says that word continue jumped out of the Bible and into his heart. He had been a quitter all his life. When the pressure got on, he quit. When he didn't like his boss, he quit his job. When it, school got too hard, he quit college. He was a quitter. But when he saw that word continue, it jumped out of the Bible and into his heart. And here we are 50 years later. 50 years later because that word continue. That's my desire today, and I know it's yours too, that we can continue in his word. Continue to be followers of Christ. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 6, 12 says, Be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We need to be faithful, committed, diligent, and walk in integrity and continue in the word. I'm encouraging you today to don't ever quit and don't ever give up. Amen. Amen.